Welcome everyone. Good to see you all. seconds to join and then Well, welcome everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Erin Neesmith, and I am very fortunate to get to work alongside Seed Your Future with a brand new program that um, is in its inaugural year called Seed to STEM. And it is offered to high school science teachers, and it helps them um, immerse themselves in the fields of horticulture and floriculture, and then connect it back to their science classroom. Um, it's been an honor to get to work with this organization, and uh, for this evening, we have a really exciting panel for you to learn more about how we bridge the gap, how we bring our students and you all as teachers um, into green futures, into green careers, and also connecting horticulture and plants directly to your classroom. Um, our panel for tonight is going to be led by Jasmine Albaran, the Executive Director of Seed Your Future, and I will pass it over to her. Hi, everybody, and thank you for being here and joining with us to learn a little bit about Seed Your Future, the horticulture industry, and hear from our wonderful panelists. So we're going to start off and give them the mic for a minute. And Rhonda, would you share a little bit about yourself, who you are, your role in science, in the plant industries, and your pathway to how you got to where you are? Yeah, so hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us this evening or this afternoon, I guess, depending on where you are. Um, and so I'm an entomologist and an educator. And so um, my path was not always a straight line. And so I think one of the things that I like to tell students, parents, and teachers is to keep an open mind because you just never know where your life is going to end up and what opportunities are going to come. And if you seize those opportunities, what those might lead to. So um, my path is a little different. Um, so I thought I was going to be a veterinarian, which probably sounds very familiar for a lot of uh, yo young people that like animals. And I like the four-legged furry kinds. And so I thought that would be my path. But then um, in high school, I had the opportunity to get an internship and they assigned me to an entomology lab. And I was terrified of insects. So I did not think this was going to be a good experience. I was terrified. But I was like, okay, it's eight weeks. Keep an open mind. I can do almost anything for eight weeks. And then I never have to go back. Um, and the funny thing is, I never had to go back because I never left. And so... <laughs> you loved it. I did. It, uh, it found me, um, I like to say. So I didn't really go finding it. Um, and that's what really led me to figure out, okay, I liked the animals and I liked these insect things and the things that they do for us in green careers and plant sciences and the interactions between things was fascinating to me. And so as a scientist, that's what I spent my career really doing is how can I use these organisms that both are beneficial and pests in the agricultural area um, and in plants in general, really. And so how do we make sure that, you know, we leave them alone when we need to, we control them when we need to, and find that balance between everything um, that we're really looking for so that we strive to have balance where it's needed um, from a sustainability standpoint, from a conservation standpoint, from a food security standpoint. I mean, there's so many things from a public health standpoint. There's so many different avenues that I think that's what's really exciting um, and why I've had an amazing career so far in um, as an entomologist, doing lots of different things and combining those with my green career in how do we protect plants and our food supply from those insect pests. And so, um, yeah, and as an educator, I love sharing this message. So here I am tonight doing that part. So thank you all again for being here and for having me. Thank you, Rhonda. We always love hearing your story and your connections. And all right, Brock, what's your story? Yeah, my story. So for me, it's always all about the plants. Everything I do in life has always been about the plants. I grew up in a family greenhouse nursery. 
Um, I, I kind of had a, a playpen that was underneath the greenhouse bench uh, until I got old enough to do things on the greenhouse bench, like actually work. So like I can remember selling uh, tomato plants when I was probably in first grade um, mm -hmm. to anybody who stopped in and would listen to me give my spiel about the best tomato plants. Um, and that, that was also very true even in, in school. So in, in first uh, grade, when the teacher asked you, what do you want to be? Everybody's going around the room. I'm going to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be this. I raised my hand and said, I want to be a grower. And so like, I think I did pretty darn good with sticking with uh, a field and an industry. Um, I, like Rhonda, kind of probably wove through it in and out a few different roles. Um, I've been a head grower um, in the family business for a period of time. I also... Um, spent some time as a research grower when I uh, when I joined um, Corteva um, several years ago, and so I was a research grower. But then I also found my way into bugs uh, that uh, kind of got me into where, where I'm at today. And so, but it was definitely on the controlling of the bugs. It was not on the necessarily of of, of keeping them or anything like that. But um, really, just found that that was a, a cool thing that I liked. It was really I was pretty good at it from being a commercial grower, and it and that kind of uh, stuck with me. And so that really kind of rolled into what I do now. And so now I have an opportunity as a national account manager to work with greenhouses and nurseries, not on the R&D side, but now on the commercial side. So I made a jump. I was a, um, from R&D over into the commercial side. And so now I help growers across the country um, control pest, disease, and weeds um, in their facilities to be able to grow the, the next best crop that they have. And so super great uh, for a plant geek like myself. It's fantastic. And you get to travel a lot for work, right? I do travel. So yeah, so my clients are from pretty much coast to coast. And so I spend a lot of time in Florida, California, Oregon, um, the East Coast, Midwest. I don't get to go to Montana, you know, too often. I don't think there's, a, you know, I kind of make that might have to be for vacation. But uh, but yeah, so I, get, I do get to travel uh, extensively throughout the U.S. Um, and pretty grateful for that, what, what, you know, that part of it as well, because that's kind of fun as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize how much you can do within the horticulture industry and the different layers that are within. So the entomology and then also the work that you're doing. All right, let's get to the next question, Rhonda. So how can we enhance STEM education to better integrate practical experiences in our food and plant systems? Yeah, so I think as educators, you know, you have these subjects that you have to teach, right? They're required of you and they're subjects. But what I think we sometimes don't do always is think, how can we connect those to everyday life? Why does it matter, right? Students are always asking that. Um, I remember when I was a high school teacher, which was for a short period of time a while ago now, um, but they would always ask like, why do I need to know this? I'm sure every teacher can relate to that statement. I'm sure. And so I think it's important to show that, you know, it's integrated. We see plants around us all the time, whether it's on our plate for our food, whether it's walking through the park, whether it's sitting on the grass during recess, whether it's playing a sport and having the turf that's there, it's all around us, but we really take it for granted, right? It's just there. And we don't even stop to notice it anymore because it's there. Um, and so I think stopping and saying, where is it and how can I connect it to the curriculum? And so, you know, if I'm teaching a math unit, I used math all the time when I was in the laboratory. I had to make dilutions, right? And so I had to figure out, okay, what are those doses going to be? How do I make a solution? How do I make a dilution? So you've got some chemistry there. You've got some mathematics there. You know, if you're wanting to do art and, and kind of bring art and science together, you can look at the parts of a plant and go through what are the parts of the plant and how do they impact one another and what is pollination and how do you draw that maybe, right? Or describe that in an English class, right? And so... I think there's lots of ways to integrate the two and to think creatively about how we bring plants because they're in our lives all the time, right? We're eating them, we're wearing them, we're looking at them, we're walking on them. <laughs> um, and so just making them kind of come front and center for some of those subjects, I think would go a long way in that um, appreciation and that understanding and then not taking it for granted anymore, that it's just there. Um, we learned a little bit, I think, in the last few years through COVID of how delicate that really is. We've taken it for granted for so many years that it's just always there and it's always around. And then when it wasn't, that was a big shock to the system. You know, when you didn't see food on the grocery store shelves because it was gone or, you know, people weren't shipping things and so there weren't flowers to be had, you know, that 
it all of a sudden disappeared. So we kind of, for a period of time there, brought it back to where we did appreciate those things that were around us. And we could spend time outdoors, right? And people were spending more time outdoors and seeing the plants around them. So, you know, to me, there's lots of different things in sciences, right? You can talk about the plant growth life cycles. You can talk about plant health. You can talk about chemistry. You can talk about all the different sciences that go involved and, and are involved in that. So to me, it's just kind of thinking creatively about where do I see plants and how do I bring those more front and center um, to really appreciate them and then connect that to the curriculum that I have to work on and that the students need to know. That's perfect. And that's one of the reasons why we created C to STEM to make it even a little bit easier, right? Once this first cohort goes through the program, we're going to have several lessons that are really going to be able to guide teachers through how to make those connections and how to pop it into their science curriculum throughout the year. Right, Brock, what are your thoughts on the question? Yeah. And I mean, for me, like I'll even go back to life experiences for me. And so here was a kid who was really, I was all for plants as a young kid. I knew I'd like that, but then I struggled with science like at an early age. And but I, what I was struggling with was being able to relate it to something. So mm -hmm. I was very much a hands-on type of learner. So for me, I wasn't doing well in just this book presentation of here's science it wasn't until mom took some extra time to take what was being, it was, was, was in the book and like, let's just go to the greenhouse and see how many of these things start to apply to what we do here. All of a sudden light went on and all of a sudden my grades in science went up and never went down. Like all of a sudden, because that light went on with like how I need to learn. And so for, for ever then I became not only a plant geek, but also became kind of a bit of a science geek too. And I think that's super important, Brock, of why it matters, right? So yeah. figure out what, what your students are really passionate about and, and what they're interested in, and then explain how plants are connected to that. Because plants are connected really to everything and everywhere, everyone, right? It's essential for life. You cannot have life without plants, um, without food, without shelter, right? And that's what plants give us. And so I think connecting that why it matters is really important. I remember, I remember going to high school even. And so like, you know, obviously I'd gotten over my like you know, fear and frustration of science and was like, uh, you know, all he told, but it became to the part where we were going to cover plant science. And like, literally the teacher was like, Brock, would you like to talk about this? For, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, and so like, you know, I, of course I brought like a car full of stuff from home and we like <laughs> dug into, you know, hands on stuff uh, in the classroom. But, I yeah. love that. I love that. Having that example, right, of this is my environment, this is what I know, and how we can relate back to school and curriculum and all that. Absolutely. Yep. Got to figure out how to make those connections. And and even then, I was also already geeking out on all the other, like, technology that was kind of in the mar in the, the marketplace that was kind of, like, that, uh, that affect a plant. So whether that be some lighting and humidity and like how those, all those things play into growing plants. And so we were doing classroom experiments, you know, with playing with some of that stuff too, you know? And so, yeah, it was, it was, it all happened because I was struggling and then all of a sudden the lights went on. And one thing that I, I always say is that when people hear the word resonate with uh, STEM, which resonates with educators, students, parents, they don't necessarily think of plant, right? They think of being a doctor and all these other industries, but those within plant science industries know how much of it is here. And that's one thing that we're wanting to do is to share out what that looks like and how you can implement that in the classroom so that the students and the parents can also to learn and, and value what this industry really has to hold. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the and the industry itself has changed. So the industry used to be very full of, I will call them mom and pop growers, you know, very similar to how family farms operate. And that that's completely changed. It's yes, there are still are plenty of, of family nurseries and, and greenhouses that are out there, but some of them in some cases have gotten quite large. And so their workforce is extremely diverse. I mean, some of the some of the facilities that I visit. Then they full blown have an R and D research, you know, department, you know, and it's not just one person; it's a team of people that are researching, you know, everything new that the, that they're going to be doing. And so, the 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 job opportunities in commercial horticulture now are 
you know, plentiful of all kinds of skill sets. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Our next question is, in what ways can we collectively create curiosity and enthusiasm for plant sciences among students, particularly those in underrepresented backgrounds? You know, how do we encourage their participation within the plant sciences? Rhonda, you want to start us off? Sure. So I think beyond just talking about the why these things matter, right, that I mentioned earlier, I think you can think of ways that appeal to the student audience, right? Whether they think that they want to be the next TikTok star or whether they care about the environment, right? There's a, there's a place for you and there's a place for you in horticulture and, and with plants. And so pairing those, I think, is one way to show that, hey, you belong and you matter and your thoughts and what you are passionate about can be used in our industry. So um, that I don't think, you know, sometimes we think, oh, you want to be a TikTok star. That's not reality, right? But there really are people that do social media for a living, right? Yeah. That's an important aspect of what you do to advertise your product, to advertise your business, to advertise opportunities. Um, and so that is a real potential career option, right? With the right kind of twist to it. Um, and so I think sometimes we roll our eyes at what students really think that they want to be these days and think, oh, that's not really for you. But I mean, that didn't exist when a lot of us were in school, right? That wasn't a career choice. And so I think that's the other thing is how do we teach students to be super flexible and to learn how they can use their skills that they have in a very transferable way, regardless of what industry that they want to go in, those skills can be applied to our industry. And so linking those two things of what is your passion? How can you describe those transferable skills that you already have? And then be a part of an industry that you feel a part of and you can impact in a greater way. Um, and I think that's what the horticulture industry has to offer. Um, and I also think it's important, you know, Brock said it a little bit earlier that, you know, he was a student that brought in all this stuff and shared his passion. And so where we can make students share what they're passionate about and encourage that and foster that, the better off they are going to be and the happier they're going to be with their careers in the long run. But then also they see someone to aspire to, right? Um, and so I think that's also really important is that they have to see people like them in positions that they want to be in. And so there's a quote in an organization that I'm a part of that says, if you can see it, you can be it. And I really think that that's important too, especially if we're trying to encourage diverse students to participate in the industry. They have to feel welcome. They have to see themselves in opportunities and success. And if there's not that visible role model for them, it's really hard. It can be done. Um, and then they become the role model, right? right. Um, but ideally you already have a role model there that they can look up to. Jasmine, you're a great example of that, right? You didn't come from a horticulture background and here you are leading a horticulture industry as one of the, the leaders in the entire industry and representing many different businesses. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of students that can look up to you as, you know, a woman, as a minority. And so I think those are things that we need more of um, and we just need to make ourselves available and show that, hey, I'm here um, and you can be like me. In fact, I want you to take my job, please. Yeah, um, right. Come, come yeah. join us because yeah. I don't want to be here forever. Right. <laughs> you want to yeah. retire at some point. I do. <laughs> and I want somebody just like me. Like I, yeah. I want to multiply me. So, yeah. Well, and, and I don't even want them like me. I want them better than me. Yeah, I want well, them yeah, to, to think yeah. more creatively than yeah. me. I want them to, yeah. to to have the next job that I don't even, I can't even imagine what the next job is yet, right? Because right. my brain is so focused on like the here and now and what I know that I have forgotten to think creatively and innovatively about like what could be and opening their, and, and that's one of the beauty of, of young people, right? Is that they don't have those preconceived notions. They don't have those barriers that we sort of, eventually put upon ourselves. And so let them break through, let them create the next, I don't know, you know, drone operators were not a thing when I was in school. And so that's a big thing now, right? And so I think there's lots of opportunities for them to, again, those transferable skills, how can you use those? Continuous learning, I think is really important as well as being comfortable with the unknown and saying, oh, that's a job that 
no one's qualified for because no one knew it was going to exist. So there's not a degree in it yet, but I can do it in the meantime. I can learn, right? Learn on the job. And so being agile and flexible um, also are, are really key things for having success. And, and I, I think the diversity of people allows us to meet those needs even better, greater, faster ways. Mm -hmm. I agree. Brock, do you have any thoughts on this question? I mean, yeah, just a couple of comments just to, to, to go along with what Rhonda said. I mean, mine goes back to some things, and I think I shared this with you before once, but recently I had a, a, a great visit with a grower out in Oregon, and, you know, they are getting larger and they're trying to get more efficient and they're just trying to overall figure out how to, you know, how to grow great plants. But they were going to hire their first electrical engineer to the nursery. Wow. So like, that's not a job that a nursery normally needs an electrical engineer, but what they wanted to do is they wanted to be able to take all of the tech stuff, GPS, all the remote sensing capabilities that are out there, all the drone mapping types of software that are all there. And they wanted to marry it all together. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't software, there wasn't stuff out there doing that. So they wanted somebody that could help them design that. And so they took somebody fresh out of college who is already pretty like used to change and doesn't necessarily know what he or she wanted to do yet at the time. And just kind of was like, sure, I that this sounds like a great challenge and I'm up for the, you know, up for, uh, up for a challenge. And so like, I think that one like stands out to me very much like, Hey, that's great. And then even just you and I, when we were down at um, Metrolina uh, late last year, we you know met the gentleman who uh, kind of set, fell in the same boat. Like he totally was not um, thinking that he was more into automation and had no idea that there was uh, opportunities in automation that would fit his skill set in a, one of the largest greenhouses in the United States. And mm -hmm. absolutely, he's found a home and he's like, all of a sudden, I mean, I'm pretty sure he has plants at home now. Like, and he never had, you know, plants before. So like all of a sudden it rubbed off, it rubbed off on him and he didn't even know about the industry. Right, right. And well, that segues us to the next question, which I'll let you piggyback off on that, uh, Brock. So what innovative approaches or technologies are emerging that could revolutionize the intersection of science, food systems, and plant industries? And how can we effectively incorporate all those um, advancements into the classroom with these teachers and students? Yeah, so like, I, I mean, the, the industries, I think, are almost endless. Um, I think if you if you can connect yourself to something that would drive innovation or efficiencies from a from a nursery or greenhouse perspective, so you don't have to take a really far leap to get to the social media thing because it we kind of makes oh we got we got to sell what we're doing so that mm -hmm. that's an easy thing. But again, the electrical engineer like, but like what were they trying to accomplish? And so you can connect that to the it back to the industry. And so it's other things that are going to be like that. The new just whatever new technology is going to be. Um, there's an awful lot of indoor growing of uh, mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables that is really kind of becoming a little bit of a trend. Some of it is because lots of fruits and vegetables are needed in big cities of population, but yet there's no land and farmland close by to do that kind of um, growing. So it's an ability to be able to get food in an area that didn't necessarily have fresh fresh food relatively close. Um and then there's also just the, the 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 cost sides of things, and so they're trying to find ways to make it more, um, make make those more feasible. So think about taking away all of the things you get from growing crops in a field or in a controlled environment, and being able to put it inside. And um, there's a lot of hurdles there. There's lots of like you could be into, you know, more water quality. You could be into um, where the wet like there's no there's the absence of true weather, and so you've got to create weather you know, in those environments, whether it be humidity, lighting, um, things like that. And so I think that, again, there's more that there are connections to, to science about how, how we can connect that to horticulture. Right. And I know there's nurseries that you can turn the lights on, change the humidity all from an iPad, right? Yep. So if students had an idea of like, look, you could use tech, but be surrounded by these beautiful plants year round, I'm sure it would be exciting to many. And one of the reasons why Seed Your Future created Green Career Week to help teachers set up those field trips or classroom presentations from industry 
so they can get to know, well, what are these careers look like? Who are these companies that are in my backyard that could eventually be employers to all of their students? Um, so any teacher out there, please find the information on our website. We'd love to get you connected to industry around you. Uh, Rhonda, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, so I go back to the innovation and how quick it moves, right? So I, I, you know, I almost say, how do we teach students to be quick on their feet and think and take opportunities that don't exist? Because by the time we teach them the technology we know of today, it's outdated tomorrow. So they're going to have to figure out, okay, I love being involved in this. I love learning new things and kind of follow that evolution of technology and innovation within as it evolves and as they grow with the industry and as they grow in their careers. And so to me, it's all about how do we create students that are innovators, problem solvers, critical thinkers, you know, those that ask why and how can it be done better? And then they go do it, right? I think that's the big piece to me of the innovation is going to continue to grow and change. We can't predict it really well. I mean, you can use the current technologies. I'm not saying don't use those, definitely use those. But, you know, in stu setting students up for success and, and looking back at my career of, you know, some of the pivots that I've made in my career have been because I've taken an opportunity where they, it wasn't something I knew about or it didn't exist or it was different and new and I had to learn. And so having that kind of built in as an expectation or as a skill that you really do develop, I think is super useful um, and will carry with you throughout a career. I agree. And I know it can be scary to make those pivots, right? But if you're brave Absolutely. enough to make them, you'd be surprised where you can get. Go ahead, Brock. Yeah. So like, I mean, I, I'm thinking about some things that I hear from growers. Um, so some things have evolved over time and some things have it as far as the industry itself goes. And so where we've gotten all this cool tech stuff that's entering in how to grow the plant, there still is some like hurdles. And then we also created some additional hurdles. So like, just think how easy Amazon is. Okay. And so like, no joke, like um, I was at a, a place today and they literally ordered when they walked in the door, you know, something on Amazon at two o'clock this afternoon, it shows up. So like we're creating an environment where we expect to be able to get our goods really quickly. Right. Okay? How do you get a tree? How do you get a plant quickly somewhere? Not in two hours. No, and, and absolutely <laughs> not. And not that we don't have e-commerce plant material like out there, but the that is becoming something that I'm hearing some of the major growers talk about like, hey, how can we, how can we like work with logistics to like be more like, cause right now, if you were to say, Hey, I need to put a plant. I mean, really you only got three days and the, the, it really starts to degrade after that. And then, but how can we even get it? And that's still not to the speed of like, I can get it this afternoon. And so like, we're, you know, everybody wants everything now. And so the, the industry recognizes this as a, as a gap. And so what can we do? What can there, what can we do from a logistics perspective? There's a whole nother career a group of like people and interests that are, you know, um, could potentially help out the industry and be very supportive. Right. When I would go buy a plant, I never thought twice where that plant came from. And clearly someone had to, from the breeder to the grower to the transportation to get it into the store, right? Yeah. I mean, so like my wife always gives me the, the list of plants that she wants while I'm traveling. Okay. So like I, I have known to put stuff in the luggage. I'm probably getting um, you know flagged at the airport a few times, but yes, I definitely travel with plants. I, I had something on the list a few years ago that I wasn't able to find. Like, and she was like, I'm done. I'm going to the internet. I'm going to get it myself. And I'm like, you're not buying it off the internet. And, I'm, okay. and she's like, yep, I'm going to do it. And then sure enough. And I'm like, she it's going to look it. ridiculous. Yeah, she did. And she found it and it showed up full size, great value. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, this is fantastic. And so then all of a sudden now I, you know, I mean, she still will use me to obviously get her plant collection. But um, at the same time though, there are like, 10 years ago, you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have got that size of a plant shipped to your door and arrive in good in good shape. That it just didn't exist. And but today it does. That's right. Today it does. And like yeah. Rhonda was saying, and who knows what careers we'll we'll have in yeah. the future for all and tomorrow them. they'll know you thought about it and it'll be on its way. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 
All right, our next question, um, Brock, will have you take this one as well. From your experience, what is the greatest gap when connecting students, science, and our plant industry? And if you had one wish to fill it, how would you fill that gap? I, my biggest concern is, is the fact that we just don't have enough folks entering into the horticulture industry in general. The number of, of people that are retiring and exiting the industry is outpacing the, the new folks coming into the industry. And so um, I will say that the, the need for more science-based type of, of folks to come into the industry is going to be really more important. That probably wasn't the same um, you know, workforce that we were looking at you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, they, we definitely need somebody that uh, has a good science background coming into the industry. So if we're just going to use a grower as the kind of the concept job, now there's lots of other jobs that are out there, but we're going to talk about growers. Like, and I, I know there's just a vast amount, number of, of folks that are looking for grower and, and uh, both head grower and, and assistant growers in, in their facilities. And that really requires a whole lot of different types of sciences um, because you got to understand water quality. You got to understand the environment. You got to understand plant science. You got to understand, you know, the chemical inter interaction. You got to understand entomology from a, from a pest perspective. So there's lots of different things that overlap from a science side that really, um, you know, so having a student come that had a good solid science background with that would be, they would be very well, you know, rounded coming into the industry. Thanks, Brock. Rhonda, what do you think about this question? Yeah, so I think Brock's right in the gap um, of, you know, there's opportunities available and waiting for people. Um, but then I guess my wish for students, if I had a wish, was that they see themselves as part of the industry and that there are opportunities that exist and that they're great opportunities for a great career. It's It can be a hobby, but it's more than a hobby. You can make a hobby a job. And so I hope that they see that. And then I also hope that they see how their skills and their strengths are needed and vital to where the industry needs to go in the future. Um, and that they are smart enough to pair those two together to explain and to be able to see how they fit into the industry and be able to explain how their skills are what the employer needs. Um, so I think if they can do that, then there's lots of opportunities and possibilities for them. Thanks, I was in a class. I was in a classroom just recently and saw a lot of students who took this particular class, um, just simply because they really like to be outside, you know. And that then drew them to other things in science and things like that. So it was a it was a way for like the industry created a job, you know. I mean, so uh, in other sides of our business, um, you know, is is golf, and so like we're not. You know, you can't crank out a bunch of golf but pros like that's, you know, that's not realistic for a career. Um, but that there aren't some, but there's just like the, there's very few, you know. However, the next best thing is to work on a golf course and be like superintendent and take care of turf, you know. And so like that's a there's another role like um, and, and numerous ones in, in, on the courses. So like, again, like just trying to find that 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 student's passion and match that up with with opportunities. Absolutely. Thank you. And Seed Your Future has 140 different career profiles that can help students do some of that exploration just to see, right, the breadth and depth and how global this industry is. So thank you both. All right, we have one last question. What is the final token of information you want teachers and students to walk away with today? If there is one thing that you would want to really impress upon them, what would that be? So Jasmine, I'm going to piggyback off of what you just said. I think going to that website and showing students that there's 142 and that's just what's on the website, right? There are probably more that we are missing. In fact, I'm sure there are more we're missing. Yeah. yeah. And so for teachers that just know that plant careers are super diverse and that we need you to be showcasing what those are for students and kind of helping them figure out how they can engage in the industry and where their strengths might fit. And um, on that website is also a, a little quiz that you can take and it'll help you figure out, okay, well, based on the things that I like to do. So like Brock said earlier about, I love being outdoors. Okay, these are the awesome careers that might be great for you if you love to be outdoors, right? Um, and so that's another key um, part of, I think, the website and something that teachers and educators can help us 
instill in the students that, hey, take a look at these. These could be options for you. Um, and making sure that parents understand that these are, are valued careers, that these are careers that have livable wages and opportunities for growth and development as well. Um, and then for students, I think if I'm talking directly to students, I think I want them to know that we need you, that you, we want you here. We need you, um, you know, learn how to sell yourself and show your skills and um, come join us. Yeah. Thanks, Rhonda. What advice would you give? What what were your, your parting words, Brock? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I again, I, I'm all about, um, you know, students being exposed to as many opportunities as possible for them to be able to find their way. Um, I think there's just not nearly enough exposure, you know, in high school, especially of all the different careers there are out there. And unfortunately, they're just pointed into like, I don't know, half dozen major buckets. And that's far from all the opportunities that are actually out there uh, in this world. And so, I mean, my wife, you know, she thought because her parents thought she should go into medical because that's what they did. And all of a sudden, you know, my wife's, um, you know, flower farmer now, you know, and so, because well, she, you know, married me, but, um, you know, like that, she's like, I just totally wasted so many years of my life because I didn't know and wasn't exposed and so here she was, you know, you know, middle-aged and made a complete U-turn uh, from a career perspective because she got exposed to it. So that's what we have to do. We have to expose to as many things as possible so that they can make those good choices. And of course, we can make choices and changes along the way. We've all done it through our careers. But at the same time, I think there's I think there's a really missing component of enough of that exposure for them to, to see what to do. I agree. And everyone... And I, and I, Think of the word horticulture, they think of, you know, just the person cutting the grass or the farmer in overalls from like 1940s, right? And this industry is so much more. Like Rhonda said, it is more than a hobby. And we want any student that loves the outdoor, that loves nature, that loves plants to realize there's so much you can do in this industry. Go ahead, Rhonda. Yeah, I was just going to say one other piece of advice that I give students is try the hard things and the scary things. Those are what make you grow the most and you learn the most about yourself and what you like and what you dislike. And so if you can kind of force students into those uncomfortable situations where they're learning something that's either hard and they think I can't do it and they prove to themselves that they can. Um, you know, I know a lot of women in science, you know, it, it becomes hard at some point and we step away from that, but tackle that say like, okay, this is hard, but I can do it. You might need to ask for help. You might struggle a little bit and that's okay you can do it. You can still be a scientist. You there's anybody can be a scientist. It's not something that we are born with. It's not an innate ability. It's something that we strive and we work hard for. And so anybody can do it. Um, so try the hard things um, and try the scary things. That's my other piece of advice. Cause I think we learn a lot during those times. Yep. I agree. Well, thank you, Rhonda and Brock. It's always a pleasure to connect with you both. Two of my some of my favorite people. Um, and I will now turn it over to Erin and get us through some of the questions. Wonderful. Thank you all. We have a great question. And Rhonda, I'm going to gear it towards you. Advice on how to get urban youth interested in farming. My New York City students tend to not feel any special connection with nature and have very little exposure to plants and growing. Yeah. So I don't know where in New York you are, um, but anywhere you are, there's a tree, a potted plant, a flower shop, a whatever. Um, bring that to them if they don't go to it, right? So so go knock on the door and say, hi, I'm a teacher, and I would love to have you come visit my class because I really want my students to experience what these green spaces are, why they're important, um, because maybe they just haven't been given that opportunity or don't see that themselves. Um, so that's what I would do. I'd say, hey, experts, please come in and talk to my students. Please bring some flowers in, bring some plants in, um, have them plant some seeds to take home with them and see if they can get them to grow in a windowsill or if they've got a balcony. Um, you know, you've got 
I, I don't know how far you are from Central Park, so maybe that's not, but that's a great local venue, at least local-ish, depending on where you are, that you can say, you know, that has a huge global impact. People will come to your city just to see that. And so, you know, building some pride in what green space you have, I think is is really special too. And you have an opportunity to say, it doesn't matter where you're from. If you're from an urban or a rural background, there's plants around you um, and they can be appreciated. The food on your table, right? Is, that also came from plants. You wouldn't, you know, be where you are today without that nutrition that you're gaining from that food. And so, you know, bring it back to what are they experiencing in their daily lives that you can bring plants into. Um, maybe talk about the differences in clothing, right? So if they're really fashion oriented, maybe you want to talk about cotton and the benefits of cotton versus other type of synthetic material and you know there's places for both I think I'm actually wearing both tonight <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so you know you can talk about that so I think there are ways in an urban setting to bring plants to them and hopefully inspire just that spark all they need is that spark maybe it's it's even creating corsages or boutonnieres for a dance that's coming up at the school it's just that or teacher's day teacher's appreciation day bring in some flowers little bouquets that they then take to their favorite teacher right something along those lines that's awesome i'll add to it and just about like how to get it to the classroom from like in new york to you know and make it relevant um almost all of the potted plants um and like even cut flowers that you'd buy at the grocery store chances are has a label and like i'm guilty of this because i want to see if it's my customer um but I, i'm looking underneath the upc for the farm name of where that crop came from and so chances are um in new york city the size of growers and stuff that they'd have to be buying from chances are is a list of one of the jobs that you have and is a company that Seed Your Future already works with and maybe even has a job profile that links to the website. Like I guarantee nine times out of 10, you're gonna, it'll link back to something that you can trace all the way back to Seed Your Future. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a good follow-up. This sounds like uh, a solution that agriculture education is. Perhaps there needs to be more collaboration between science education and ag education. Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> but that, that that that's in so many different ways. Um, it's not only from the students need to have more education, but the existing population needs to be educated on, on agriculture and horticulture as well. Um, just to better understand the industry and where our food and everything comes from. So absolutely. But the only way to make that change is to start somewhere. And so if we start with students, then in, if we instill that early on, that continues on for generations. And then all of a sudden we have an, you know, we have a pop population who has been trained on this, you know, the interactions of, of the industry and science. And I think ag educators and science teachers do need to be working together. I think you can learn a lot and share a lot with one another um, because like it or not, not every student is gonna become a doctor and a nurse um, and not every school has an agriculture program, right? And so science teachers, uh, and I think any integration where we can talk about science and other subjects or science and whatever the students are interested in um, and still meet the needs, right, of the school and the educator, um, are kind of the key areas, right? That's the golden circle. <laughs> we can overlap all of those things um, so that they're working together. I think we learn from one another um, and students get a better, well-rounded um, options um, put forth. And again, it's related back, if you can relate it back to what they care about, I think that's even stronger. But yes, I think there needs to be um, great collaboration between our educators too. And so, you know, if, if your school district maybe doesn't have a program and you're looking for someone, um, reach out, you know, if you reach out to your fellow educator that's in the district next to you, or, um, you know, I, I know a couple of schools that have kind of, I don't want to call them pen pals because it's not really pen pal. It's, it's kind of peer mentoring, I would say, um, program where they reached out, they made connections, and now they kind of bounce ideas off of one another of like, okay, I have to teach, you know, this system, whatever that system is, and or subjects matter. And they share, okay, here's how I would do it. 
you know, with a plant example, and here's how I do it with an animal example or a human health example. And, you know, usually those are very independent things, but what if we showed students all of those options instead of just one? So, so true. Uh, Shirley also said in the chat um, to connect with your local extension office or your local 4-H office. They're always a wealth of knowledge as well. Okay, uh, yeah. last question. It's a selfish one for me, but I have a 10-year-old who I constantly look at and wonder what he's going to do when he is older. So my curiosity is, what is a, a current uh, positive problem um, that you are facing in your current industry that you think one of our students is going to solve? Well, they can solve anything that they put their mind to. So I'm I'm just going to go out on a limb. I'm pretty optimistic that the future generation is going to do better than we have done. Um, so I think if you look at the big global challenges that we have around food security, um, retiring aging populations and the increases of various diseases, right? Um, I think a lot of times people are like, well, but that's human health. That's true, but a lot of it is nutrition-based and nutrition-based goes back to plants and food. And so I think there's, there's a key role that, that students will probably be looking more holistically at lifestyles. Um, and part of that includes what we're talking about today with plants. Um, you know, climate change is another one that I think students, again, are gonna be the ones to hopefully help solve and or reverse that trend. And a great way to do that is through plants, you know, whether that's habitat restoration, whether that is, you know, making new types of plants that are bird absorbing more CO2 out of the environment or making some sort of device, engineering device that helps plants be more efficient. I don't know what it's going to be, right? That's why they're going to do it. Um, but I, you know, I think your 10 year old son is going to solve some of these problems and, and will they solve all of them? No, there will be new ones, of course. Right. Um, I think that's just life in general is you solve one problem and the next one arises. Um, and some of the problems that we don't know about yet, they will inherit, unfortunately. Um, and, but that's what society does is we figure out, okay, what are the needs and how do we have that innovation to go tackle it? And if we empower our students to say, Hey, you are the innovators. And I would also challenge that it doesn't have to be in the future. Your 10 year old can come up with that solution today. I think we need to empower students to say, you are the problem solvers of today. You don't have to wait until you're in a quote unquote career in some number of years um, to start making a difference. You can do that today. Just, you know, if you have a great idea, go do it, go implement it, um, find people and mentors to help you. Um, yeah, that's, that's my thoughts. Anything from you, Brock? No, I, I mean, I think Rhonda, Rhonda really covered it um, pretty well there. But I, I think for me, I'm going to, I'll stick it. Rhonda went to food and food security and stuff. And so I'll go back into more just in horticulture in general. Um, I, I think the... I think the speed in which we're able to adapt is going to change drastically. It's already changed a lot in the short amount of time, but I think we're going to get really, we're going to get better, you know, at bringing out new products, new, you know, new plants, new varieties, new whatever, you know, and I think we're going to be able to do it faster uh, and better and we'll end up with some cool things out of it. And so like, yeah, I completely depend on, um, on the, the, the next workforce to be able to, to do those things and, and to carry on some of, you know, some of the traditions that we have, but create new ones as, as, as they go. The other thing that I've noticed about kind of the next generation too, is they deeply, deeply care. They care about these things. Yeah. And, if, and, and in that, that is going to change all of our industries, regardless of what industry we're talking about, but the horticulture industry, I think started already during COVID, we saw people adopt plants mm -hmm. and come back to owning a plant and trying to care for a plant and then being so disappointed when they kill a plant and saying like, oh no, and having to start over. But that's part of the learning process. So I, I like to say, we no one ever fails. Fail is, the definition of fail is first attempt in learning, F-A-I-L, first attempt in learning. And so when you killed that plant the first time, you learn something, either I overwatered it, I didn't water it enough, I didn't have it in the right conditions. So you tried it again, right? And that's okay. We learn from doing. 
and this generation really does care and they're going to keep striving all even us old farts off to keep doing better yeah yeah i think that helps too go ahead Brett. yeah i i got an initiative that's been in the industry that we just have never gotten over the hurdle of um so there's no surprise that we use an awful lot of plastic containers in the industry and mm-hmm. i guarantee that next generation gets us over the hump because of their deep care for the environment and like sustainability that they, they, they will finally get through the cost challenge that, that it has because they were passionate about it and they use their passion to drive the salute to get to a solution. And then it'll, boom, and maybe it does have it change our perception of cost. And maybe we have to le- learn to live with something, but I guarantee we get away from an industry that had a lot of plastic usage to an industry that has a very sustainable system um for all the plants that we grow and that would be amazing i'd be super excited by that and it'll go directly in the ground you won't even have to take it out of the pot that's right yeah Love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah easier now too right yeah. yep yep simplified the process yep. oh and it, it might even be embedded with nutrients in there so that you can't even within the first right. month kill your plant <laughs> i don't right. know like I these are the totally ideas buy that plant I know, <laughs> but these are these are ideas that students are going to come up with Yep. No doubt. Yep. We just need to empower them and say, go do it. And right. like I said, don't, you don't have to wait till tomorrow to go do it. You could go do it now. If you got a great idea. Mm-hmm. We had one There's more, no, no age restriction. And I would Sorry. love for someone to answer quickly. It says, I have been told teaching horticulture requires a greenhouse. Is there a way to fund horticulture education through grants, donations, et cetera? I can start that one off. Um, if you go to the Seed Your Future website, Resources Educator, we have a web page where there is a list of grants that you can look into applying. And those are grants from partners that we have. But you can also send an email to info at seedyourfuture.org. I usually check that and can help connect you with maybe a greenhouse in your local area. Several partners sometimes will have extra products, so extra plants, extra soil, whatever that might look like. And they're always looking at donating that to teachers in their area. So think about who's around you, a garden center, uh, a greenhouse, nursery, public garden, and then just send them an email and say, hey, I'm a teacher. I have this amount of students. This is where I'm located. Do you have anything extra? And would you mind coming and talk to our students and helping us, whether planting it or learning about how to grow and maintain it? So there's definitely lots of help. We just got to find it for you wherever you are. And you absolutely don't need a greenhouse to do it. I went to a pro through a program that did not have a greenhouse and learned plant science is just fine. So plant science and horticulture can be taught um, without a greenhouse. Yep. Yeah. Get creative. Mm-hmm. Well, wonderful. We appreciate you all so much for being here panelists. Thank you so much for your expertise and your wisdom. Um, it is certainly um, always important to connect our students to the experts in the field. Um, but even mentors, uh, when you go to the collegiate level, um, have them connect with a college student who's going through the program to see what their experiences are like, to encourage, uh, whether it's post-secondary education or directly into the workforce, um, we encourage you to make those connections. Encourage those students to try something hard, like playing with bugs and seeing if it sticks. Um, and, and we encourage you, as educators and parents, to be the affirmers of the unknown. Uh, When they come up with a fun TikTok idea, encourage it, especially if it is something that challenges the norm when it comes to uh, a a problem that we might face in our environment. Um, Thank you all again. You all will receive an email from me. Um, It includes the link to this recording and then also a class resource. So you can share this recording with your class or a segment of the recording. Um, and your students can fill in an activity sheet to learn more about our panelist team and then also the careers and industries involved in horticulture and plants and science. Uh, Thank you all so much. Have a blessed rest of your evening. Be safe and thank you for what you do. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Bye.